Hey, fellow proletarians, members of the revolutionary class, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the May 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And this is an audiobook of an article called An Introduction to Cooperatives by Jesus Cruz Reyes and Camila Pinheiro Harnecker. This is from a collection titled Cooperatives and Socialism, A View from Cuba, edited by Camila Pinheiro Harnecker. We're going to do a lot of these articles on the channel because they are all about the topic of worker cooperatives, which get brought up often in countries like the United States. And we are going to read some articles that connect this concept with socialism, like actual socialism, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Che Guevara, and so on. So I think that this is spot on for a lot of the discussions that are being had right now. Uh, so we're going to try to tackle the subject the best that we can. It's also a lead up to a series we're going to do on Richard Wolff and his politics and his teachings and uh, thought that this would be some good background information for everyone going into this subject. I personally have been a member of a worker cooperative and around that time I did about two years of like pretty solid study uh, of the worker cooperative subject uh, reading papers on websites like usworker.coop, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Um, I will say that a lot of, you know, what is out there in the literature is not from a revolutionary socialist perspective in the slightest. It really has more to do with uh, the fact that, you know, boomer era business owners are retiring and or dying. They're, they often think that their children are going to inherit the business, but in most cases, the children or family does not want the business. And um, so, you know, if the workers can buy out the business, that's better than it falling into the hands of like Bain Capital or something like that. But uh, it's often not discussed, at least from what I've seen in the context of what we talk about, you know, in the world of Marxism, Leninism, uh, you know, uh, of like a struggle against capitalism per se, and, you know, uh, all the tie-ins to imperialism. There will be a little bit of discussion of that, but it is not really um, pursued in a confrontational kind of manner. But anyway, this is the first article, An Introduction to Cooperatives, and uh, we're going to go through this topic one by one. So let's get into the audiobook. According to the International Cooperative Alliance, or ICA, more than 800 million people in the world today are organized into cooperatives, spanning a diverse array of economic activities. To list just a few examples, one out of every three working-age Canadians is a member of at least one cooperative, and that is also the case with one out of three in France, one out of four in Argentina, one out of five in Germany, one out of five in India, one out of ten in Costa Rica, and one out of ten in Colombia. Regarding the economic importance of cooperatives, according to the ICA in 2010, in Western Europe, the immense majority of agricultural producers are organized into cooperatives, controlling more than half the market for agricultural products. In fact, cooperatives in Finland produce 96% of dairy products, 50% of eggs, and 34% of forestry products. In France, they control more than 40%, of agricultural and non-agricultural food production. In Uruguay, cooperatives produce 90% of milk and 30% of wheat. 22% of New Zealand's gross domestic product, GDP, was generated by cooperatives in 2007. And in 2009, cooperatives accounted for 5.7% of Brazil's total GDP, 37.2% of its agricultural GDP, and close to 5% of Colombia's GDP. However, these figures should be taken with a grain of salt because a considerable number of enterprises that identify themselves as cooperatives do not actually practice the principles of cooperativism. Some stray from that ideal due to internal and external factors. Others only call themselves cooperatives to obtain access to benefits granted by state policies that promote these forms of associative enterprises. In addition, a large number of cooperatives throughout the world are formed for the purpose of product distribution rather than production and financial services, i.e. credit unions, and some are possibly too big to
to practice democratic management. Even so, the role of cooperatives in the world is significant, and their activities benefit some 3 billion people, about half the world's population, according to 1994 UN estimates. The impact has been so great that the UN declared 2012 as the International Year of Cooperatives. Beneficiaries are not just low-income people. They also include people from middle and high-income groups who choose to consume conscientiously and responsibly and or to produce in relationships of association and cooperation instead of subordination and competition. The cooperatives that have achieved the most success and sustainability have joined second and third degree cooperatives. One of the best known is the National League of Cooperatives in Northern Italy, founded in 1886, which united the largest number of cooperatives in its time, most of them in industrial or artisan manufacturing. Currently, the Mondragon Corporation is the largest cooperative group in the world, the number one business group in the Basque country, and the seventh largest in Spain. Mondragon is made up of more than a hundred cooperatives that operate mostly in finance, industry, distribution, and knowledge. Venezuela became one of the countries with the most cooperatives in the world, an estimated 30,000 to 70,000, after the Hugo Chavez government established policies for their promotion. However, few have become firmly consolidated. In addition to factors such as inadequate support from the state, they have remained isolated, failing to benefit from the advantages of cooperation. In fact, the most outstanding case in that country is the Central Cooperative for Social Services of the state of Lara, Central Cooperativa de Servicios Sociales de Lara, which was created in 1967 and unites some 80 consumer and production cooperatives, taking advantage of the benefits of integration. In Cuba, Three types of cooperatives exist today, all of them in agriculture, for a total of approximately 6,300 in 2009, according to figures from the National Office of Statistics. However, a significant number of them do not actually operate as cooperatives because they do not have the necessary autonomy to make basic decisions on issues, such as the supply of their inputs and the distribution of their products, and cooperative education has been scarce. Today in Cuba and in other countries, efforts are underway to find alternatives to state and private capitalist enterprises, alternatives that are more participatory, more solidarity-based, more just, and in short, more effective, achieving simultaneously efficacy and efficiency for the socioeconomic development of their people. This does not mean that cooperatives are the only choice or that they should replace other enterprise forms. They're simply one more option with advantages and limitations. Cooperatives are the most widespread enterprise alternative in the world, not the only one, and have proven their effectiveness and sustainability, although that is not always the case, of course. This chapter is focused on explaining what cooperatives are, with an emphasis on production cooperatives. It begins with an outline of the conditions that led to the emergence of the first cooperatives, and that continue to motivate and bring about their creation. Exploitation, marginalization, and alienation inherent to the capitalist system originate and aggravate problems that affect everyone and that can only be solved through collective action. Cooperatives are one of the tools for that. The functioning of this type of associative business is described by analyzing the organizational principles that should be implemented in every genuine cooperative. The specific characteristics of cooperatives are made more evident when compared with capitalist businesses. In concluding, the chapter indicates the potential advantages of cooperatives over other types of organizations. What is a cooperative? A cooperative is a group or association of natural and legal persons, including other cooperatives, for cooperatives of a higher tier, which are discussed below, who have joined together voluntarily to fulfill common economic, social, and or cultural needs and aspirations by means of a jointly owned, democratically controlled, autonomous, and open enterprise. In fact, a cooperative's means of production may be legally owned by external entities, including some of its members, who decide to lease it to the cooperative. Therefore, what is important is not the legal owner of the means of production, 
assuming this owner is willing to lease under reasonable stable terms, but the fact that the members have these resources at their disposition and are able to manage them democratically with a common goal. I just want to comment there briefly. That is something I've heard Richard Wolff say recently, and I don't really know where this is coming from because everything I ever read about cooperatives actually did stress the owner of the means of production being the workers. I'm still trying to trace down the roots of this sort of divergence in the definition, and maybe I just have the wrong idea, but honestly, everything I have read stressed that part of the way that the cooperative alleviates exploitation or you know defeats those kinds of motivations is that the people do own it themselves. The people who work it own it. That's like in every cooperative slogan I have ever heard. And I did read this literature extensively. So perhaps we will learn more about that over the course of these readings. I would not go by that definition. And uh, honestly, that, that concerns me a little bit, particularly as we have so many people trying to substitute cooperatives for more traditional forms of socialist and communist struggle. So that, uh, that is not something I personally am on board with. All right, let's get back to the text. A cooperative is simultaneously an association and an enterprise, a business. However, it is an enterprise in which the associative and social dimension guides its operation. Also, a production cooperative is an enterprise in which each worker has the same decision-making power. That is, it is independent of how much he or she has contributed to the cooperative's capital. This is an enterprise of persons, not capital. Cooperatives as actors in a solidarity or social economy. Cooperatives are said to form part of the third sector because they are neither state nor privately owned. They are collectives. As mentioned previously, what is important is not the legal ownership of the means of production. Comment again, I object. But the fact that cooperatives are democratically managed by a collective, not by representatives of the state or private individuals or institutions. However, that collective management should not respond only to the interests of the cooperative's members. Cooperatives are expected to be committed to the local development of the communities where they are located or where their members live. Comment. I really got to say the idealism already <laughs> up to this point is hurting my brain. So um, we're going to continue on, but I just had to pause there for a second to regroup. Okay. That is, cooperatives should be democratically managed by their collectives, but in a socially responsible way, responding to social interests. Should. In fact, they are also, I mean, capitalists should do that too. They don't fuck, anyway. In fact, they are also considered to be part of what is known as a, quote, solidarity economy, or, quote, social economy. Cooperatives as a form of self-management. Cooperatives are part of a larger group of self-managed organizational forms, which may be identified by the fact that the workers themselves democratically manage their enterprise. Self-management means to take it upon ourselves to solve problems to meet our needs with our own labor, creativity, and effort, managing our resources democratically and in the interest of all. Self-managed organizations are not limited to the economic sphere. They also exist in the public sphere, in local governments, and in political organizations. That is, cooperatives emerge when a group of people unite to solve a common problem, choosing to provide a solution to their problem through collective instead of individual efforts. They recognize the advantages of cooperative work and the superiority of relations of cooperation that are established when the management of an enterprise is truly democratic. Different types of cooperatives. The most relevant criterion for classifying a cooperative is the activity of its members. That activity may be the production of goods and services or the consumption of goods and services. Some cooperatives are mixed and are involved in both types of activities. Cooperatives may produce any good or offer any type of service and in turn may consume any type of good or contract any type of service. According to the activity carried out by their members, Cooperatives may be classified as 
cooperatives for the production of goods and services. These are goods of natural or legal persons that unite to jointly produce goods, agricultural, industrial, etc., and services, food, repair, transportation services, etc. When most of the workers are members, that is, only a minority are hired workers, the organizations are also known as workers' cooperatives, or associated labor cooperatives, to emphasize that they are based on the collective work of a group of persons who also own the enterprise. So comment, okay, so workers' cooperatives is mainly what I have studied, and uh, I guess uh, I came into this book assuming a little bit that's what we were talking about. There are also consumer co-ops, and we're going to get into that. I don't consider consumer co-ops, I mean, they're, they're not... <laughs> I've seen labor organizing campaigns at consumer co-ops that treat the workers just as badly as any capitalist business. They're really nothing. I mean, all you have in a consumer co-op is you've taken retail capitalism, that is acquiring uh, goods from a producer and then selling them at a markup, that's the profit, and you have basically just taken that you know, retail profit aspect and split it among members uh, who have bought a share of the thing. Um, I mean, you can get some deals as a member of a consumer co-op. Fundamentally, a lot of these behave exactly like any other business. All right, moving on. Cooperatives for the consumption of goods and services. These are groups of natural or legal persons that unite to jointly obtain goods of any type, generally consumption goods, but also intermediary goods or production inputs for those comprised of cooperatives or other enterprises, as well as services of any type, the most common being savings and loans. These enable members to enjoy the benefits of wholesale buying and obtaining goods and services at lower prices. Consumer cooperatives also make it possible for their members to acquire goods and services of assured quality and with the specifics technical, ethical, etc., that they desire. Workers in consumption cooperatives are not necessarily members. So commenting, this is exactly what I was just talking about, consumer cooperatives. Um, the whole thing for me is worker cooperatives. So if we're going to start lumping in consumer cooperatives, that really changes the game. Consumer cooperatives, they are also called buying clubs in some circles because it's basically a bunch of consumers get together to form a quote buying club and then you can buy from producers at wholesale rather than retail prices but then in the end i mean members often want you know this used to be better deals i think in the old days uh today most of these i mean there's such a retail apocalypse going on that like you're going to get maybe a 10 percent discount or something like that um so i can't say i'm hugely supportive of consumer co-ops maybe they are a little bit better than um, you know a regular say like a Whole Foods that's owned by Amazon I mean I guess I would rather have it be owned by like local people and it can respond a little bit more to the community in the end um, I don't know I guess I would have to see more data on specific comparisons but I think we are somewhat watering down the definition here by getting away from worker cooperatives so moving on back to the text Mixed cooperatives. These are groups of persons or cooperatives that unite to jointly produce certain goods and services and, at the same time, to jointly acquire certain goods and services. Cooperatives may also be classified according to their level of integration. Groups of people or of legal entities that are not cooperatives are considered as first tier or primary cooperatives. Cooperatives formed by a group of cooperatives are second tier cooperatives, or groups or unions. In their turn, cooperatives formed by second-degree cooperatives are third-tier cooperatives, also known as federations or confederations. More recently, multi-stakeholder or multi-participant cooperatives have been created, where more than one type or category of members, workers, consumers, and providers of capital or inputs, and even representatives of social interests, can participate in decision making. These are basically forms of co-management among these different groups that share common interests and are willing to work together to achieve common goals. The most known cases are 
solidarity cooperatives in Canada, and social cooperatives in Italy. Comment. So that's the end of that section. I just want to recap because I did a lot of kind of angry commenting. So basically they broke it down as worker cooperatives, where workers are the primary owners of the means of production. And it's, it's a voluntary union of workers to the extent that work is at all voluntary, uh, where you're you know, collectively sharing ownership and management. Okay. Then there's consumer cooperatives or a buying club where you just come together to defeat retail capitalism, basically, and you buy at wholesale prices. Although by the time that you've set up a storefront and everything else, you have so much overhead that you've really just eaten into your uh, discount dramatically. And then mixed cooperatives, uh, aka solidarity co-ops, um, first tier or primary cooperatives. Cooperatives formed by a group of cooperatives are second tier cooperatives or groups or unions. In their turn, cooperatives formed by second degree cooperatives are third tier cooperatives, also known as federations or confederations. More recently, multi-stakeholder or multi-participant cooperatives have been created where more than one type or category of members, workers, consumers, and providers of capital or inputs, and even representatives of social interests, can participate in decision making. These are basically forms of co-management among these different groups that share common interests and are willing to work together to achieve common goals. The most known cases are solidarity cooperatives in Canada and social cooperatives in Italy. Comments. So that's the end of that section. I just want to recap because I did a lot of kind of angry commenting. So basically they broke it down as worker cooperatives where workers are the primary owners of the means of production. And it's, it's a voluntary union of workers to the extent that work is at all voluntary, uh, where you're, you know, collectively sharing ownership and management. Okay. Then there's consumer cooperatives or a buying club where you just come together to defeat retail capitalism basically and you buy at wholesale prices. Although by the time that you've set up a storefront and everything else, you have so much overhead that you've really just eaten into your uh, discount dramatically. And then mixed cooperatives, which are maybe doing both at the same time. Lastly, you have the concept of first tier or primary cooperatives, which are groups of people or legal entities, which are not cooperatives. And then second tier cooperatives, uh, also called groups or unions, which are cooperatives of cooperatives. And then third tier uh, cooperatives or federations or confederations, which are cooperatives of cooperatives of cooperatives. Okay, hope that's clear. Next section, the origin of cooperatives. The essence of cooperatives, organizations in which work is done collectively and without bosses, has existed since the origin of human beings. As Engels explained, the human species emerged basically as a product of labor. What made the first humans different from primates was their ability to work, to imagine something and make it happen by transforming nature. In most cases, that labor consisted of activities that were carried out collectively by a group in societies where private property did not yet exist. Thus, in primitive communities, the first human beings worked collectively and cooperatively. Subsequently, even though other forms of organizing labor, such as slavery, feudalism, and capitalism, have predominated, cooperative labor has continued to exist in different ways. With the advance of capitalism's individualistic ideology, cooperatives and other forms of self-management have been promoted by certain religious and political groups, above all utopian communists, which have championed collective solutions over individual ones, recognizing that the latter always end up disregarding the interests of others and corrupting the human essence. The first modern cooperatives emerged with the terrible effects of the Industrial Revolution in England in the late 18th century. Extremely long workdays in abysmal conditions with no rights in the eyes of the bosses and with pay much lower than what was needed to simply eat. In addition, workers faced high prices and adulterated products. Apparently, 
the earliest cooperatives were formed as cultural, educational, and journalistic institutions that attempted to instruct workers and ease the burden of misery imposed on them by a capitalist society. Many of them were consumer cooperatives that sought to meet the needs of workers, principally for food, by taking advantage of the aforementioned benefits that these associations provide to their members. For example, in 1760, a group of millers formed a cooperative that bought wheat and milled it, and then sold the flour at cheaper prices, breaking the monopoly on flour sales. Production cooperatives also were formed, mostly in agriculture. A large number of the first modern cooperatives that appeared in the late 18th century and early 19th century suffered economic failures, principally because they did not take into account the importance of effective business operations. They sold products at cost or gave them away for free without ensuring that they could cover their costs and maintain at least a reserve fund for emergencies. An excessive emphasis was placed on the short-term social aspect of the organization without ensuring the organization's economic reproduction and thus its sustainability. Moreover, in most cases, they were created with money contributed by wealthy individuals, and thus, when those patron funds dried up, the cooperatives collapsed. While these projects did benefit their members, they had not come out of the efforts or contributions of the members. In some cases, these cooperatives failed because they operated on land or in facilities that was leased without sufficient legal guarantees, and the owners of that land or facilities could decide to stop renting to the cooperative members whenever they wanted. In addition, cooperatives were heavily influenced by pre-Marxist utopian socialists, especially the ideas advocated by Saint-Simon, Owen, and Fourier, who criticized capitalism from an ethical moral standpoint, disregarding the antagonistic contradictions between the working class and the capitalist class and the consequent political implications. That is, they did not value the importance of political organization and integration for cooperatives, which would have made them better able to defend their rights and increase their possibilities of success. Meanwhile, the bourgeoisie that controlled commerce organized to use every means possible to crush the consumer cooperatives that affected their interests. The success of the first consumer cooperatives provoked the ire of the large merchants, who succeeded in achieving a ban on public officials participating in these cooperatives. Similarly, agricultural production cooperatives were thrown off the land where they operated. The first modern cooperative to gain recognition. On October 24, 1844, the Rockdale Society of Equitable Pioneers, also known as the Rockdale Pioneers, was officially registered. It is best remembered as the first successful modern cooperative. It was formed by a group of 28 weavers from a cotton thread factory in the working class district of Rockdale, Manchester, who had decided to unite to create a consumer cooperative. The group planned to open a cooperative warehouse where the members and their families could buy quality basic goods at accessible prices. They agreed that each member would contribute money to a common fund for approximately one year until they had the minimum necessary capital, the equivalent of $128, to rent a locale where their cooperative warehouse or consumer cooperative would operate. The cooperative bought basic goods at wholesale prices and then sold them to members at prices just above cost. At first, the cooperative was only open for one afternoon weekly due to the low volume of its operations. However, by the fourth month, it was open five afternoons weekly. The Rockdale Cooperative's members included communists, chartists, trade union leaders, and others who had decided to jointly solve their common problems. Many of them had participated in struggles against the bosses of the textile factory where they worked. They established seven principles for the cooperative's operation, which were decisive to the organization's success, making it a model for the future. 1. Open membership. 2. Political neutrality. 3. One member, one vote. Three, limited interest on capital. Five, cash sales. Six, earnings that return to members. Seven, education and training. These principles reflected the context of the Rockdale Cooperative's emergence, as well as its emphasis on economic aspects and its indifference to the need for social transformation. However, this first successful cooperative was the inspiration for many consumer cooperatives 
that were subsequently created in England, France, and Germany. In fact, according to diverse estimates, by the early 20th century, a total of 1.7 million Britons were members of consumer cooperatives. The creation of Rockdale is said to have been the beginning of a stage of cooperativism that is characterized by an emphasis on profitability and an abandonment of the ethical-moral struggle against the capitalist system. Different tendencies have always existed within the cooperative movement, some even promoting the capitalization of cooperative members by dividing their assets into stocks to be equally distributed to the members. On the other hand, the most radical tendencies have always championed the intrinsic value of human beings, the importance of political organizing by workers, and the need to overcome capitalism and not be limited to operating within its rules and logic. Comment. I must say, as we go on, this article is getting better. I uh, <laughs> really kind of got my hackles up, but um, the, uh, the, as I skimmed through this, it seemed to have a good perspective, so I was a little thrown off by the intro there, but uh, this is getting better. Continuing. Basic principles of cooperatives. Time has shown that successful cooperatives take certain organizational principles into account. The International Cooperative Alliance recommends the following seven principles. Open and voluntary membership. Any person, without regard to gender, race, social class, or political or religious opinion, may apply to be a member. The person should be capable of producing, or in the case of consumer cooperatives, utilizing services. It is also important that the applicant is willing to accept the responsibilities of being a member, which should be included among members' duties in the cooperative's internal regulations and informal and informal work norms. Just as cooperatives should be open to accepting the applications of potential new members, they may also decide to expel members. The criteria for making these types of decisions should be clearly established in the cooperative's internal regulations. The decision to include or expel a member should be made by a general assembly of all members. These are generally among the most important decisions covered by the general rules, applicable to all cooperatives, and individual cooperatives' internal regulations, and therefore require more than a simple majority to reach an agreement. It is important to note that in some countries, a worker who is hired by a cooperative has the right to apply to be a member after a certain length of time, six months according to Venezuelan law, for example. In other countries, wage workers may be hired for an indefinite period of time, but may not make up more than a certain percentage of the total cooperative membership. In the Basque country, it is 20%, although this is not complied with by the Mondragon Group, which in 2008 had close to 30,000 members and some 60,000 wage workers. Hmm. So commenting here, um, the co-op that I was part of was small. We uh, had less than 10 members. Um, however, we were able to keep an extremely high percentage, as was our want. Uh, we, we really wanted to keep it as free of wage work as possible. Um, and so most of the time, well, at least for our core hours, we were better than 90% uh, member driven. Um, our buy-in period was 12 months. We had tried shorter periods and found that that really didn't work. Um, but we had a 12 month buy-in period. So you work a uh, regular amount of hours, not seasonally, not fill in, but regular amount of hours per week after you do that for a year, uh, which is what we found it took for people to really get familiar with all the different parts of the business that they would need to be familiar with as a worker to be able to manage and you know have a vote in decisions. So after a year of working there, you could buy in. We kept uh, sweat equity pretty low. Um, I think the most it ever was was $1,000. So which you, you could just work off with a certain amount of sweat equity, like you would just work a few extra hours per week for a certain amount of time, and then that would buy your share. And uh, even in the meantime, while somebody we, like we basically loaned people shares, they just had to uh, either pay cash or work hours um, to catch up within that certain amount of time. Uh, we did occasionally hire wage workers, mostly for just we had a particular like seasonal demand. We would hire some people. We tended to keep that to like students and people who 
uh, we would have a relationship. Mo most of them came back for more than one year. And um, we even invited them to attend meetings, although they wouldn't have a vote. But um, honestly, like, like I said, it was a fairly small association and um, we were able to keep things very democratic. Some of the limits on that were um, vendor and credit agreements where somebody had to write a personal, not a collective, uh, you know, you had to sign the dotted line where if the business didn't pay, it would also hurt whichever owner had signed for it. It would, it would hurt their personal credit as well. So there were limits imposed by the system. Anyway, that was how the, the co-op that I was part of addressed that. I think that's kind of disgusting that Mondragon is using twice as much wage work uh, as they are member work. I don't know what the breakdown in hours is. Like I said, our co-op was, I think, better than 90% uh, worked by members or people who were in there by and, you know, on track to become members. So if you're going to do it, do it. Um, all right, next section, democratic management by the members. The members of a cooperative participate actively in all decisions related to the cooperative's management, either directly in general assemblies or indirectly through democratically elected representatives. Likewise, members should participate directly in at least the strategic and most important non-strategic decisions, such as the election of representatives and executives, production plans, budgets, distribution of surplus, wage criteria, and the approval or cancellation of membership. When decisions are adopted in general assemblies, all members, no matter how much they've contributed in capital or labor, have the same voting right, one member, one vote. In higher tier cooperatives, groups or federations, different democratic representative procedures are used so that each member cooperative can participate in decision making. Obviously, not all of a cooperative decisions should be made in general assemblies with the participation of all members, especially as the membership grows. Cooperatives can create executive committees that are charged with making certain decisions, purchases, sales, maintenance, etc., that represent the interests of the whole membership. These committees, as well as the cooperative's directors and executives, should periodically report on their activities and may be recalled by a general assembly if their performance is considered unsatisfactory. Cooperatives may establish different organizational structures with executive and representational functions according to what the members decide. Nevertheless, the General Assembly should always be the highest decision-making body. So uh, in, in my case, the co-op that I was involved in, pretty much everything was done by direct democracy or General Assembly because it was small, like 10 or fewer people, and um, we were able to function in that way. Sometimes if we came up with a you know, particular task that needed more ongoing management, uh, people would volunteer. We would, out of that general assembly, decide you know, who wanted to take on that particular project or you know, committee work kind of thing. I mean, we're small enough even that you know, we wouldn't necessarily call it a committee if it was like one or two people working on the thing. But um, it was very democratic. This was something uh, that really attracted me to the whole concept of, you know, after a long time of working menial stuff and getting pushed around, um, the opportunity to do something where I was directly part of the decision making, that was uh, definitely something that was, it, it perked me up, you know, honestly. It's like we have work in society that is grunt work and not fulfilling, but it's amazing what it can do for you, um, the confidence boost and just the decreased feeling of alienation when you're involved in that decision making. Um, I will say though, like I said before about the vendors and the creditors, even just dealing with customers, um, it, you have a new boss, <laughs> you realize. There may be nobody internal to you over your head in the co-op, uh, but the customers, uh, they certainly will try to be your boss <laughs> instead. So that's another thing that you have to deal with. So, you know, it, it, uh, it definitely changed my perspective on the whole being part of an enterprise, being part of a worker, being in that position of shared power, uh, but it is certainly not problem free. So continuing economic participation of members, the economic participation of a cooperative's members is twofold. They contribute capital to the cooperative 
and they benefit from the results of their management. Members contribute indirectly to a cooperative's capital by equally contributing their labor power or productive capacities, skills, creativity, effort, and dedication. Therefore, and especially in production cooperatives, each member is expected to contribute his or her maximum labor to the cooperative according to his or her ability. It is important to note that, unlike non-democratically managed enterprises, cooperatives do have the mechanisms and incentives to guarantee that workers also contribute their ideas and formal and informal knowledge. If a member has resources, equipment, tools, land, a locale, etc., that he or she wishes to contribute to the cooperative, an agreement can be reached on the terms of use. The owner may rent, sell, or donate them. Generally, cooperatives stipulate that membership requires the contribution of a certain amount of money to the group's assets, the same amount for everyone. This member's contribution to the social capital of the cooperative may be gradually discounted from the income that the member receives for his or her work. It helps to strengthen members' commitment to the cooperative. On the other side of economic participation, cooperative members participate in obtaining the results of their management, basically in three ways advance payments, returns, and social funds. The advance payment is what each member receives monthly, or sometimes weekly or bi-weekly, generally in the form of monetary income. In a traditional business, this would be wages, but here it loses that meaning because to the extent that the cooperative's management is truly democratic, the wage-labor relationship is replaced by one of associated labor. Workers are not selling their labor power in exchange for a wage. Returns are what each member receives at the end of the fiscal year, if the cooperative has any surplus after meeting all of its tax, financial, and legal obligations, such as paying into obligatory funds, which are mentioned further on, and if it has been decided that part of the surplus will be distributed among the members. These first two benefits are obtained on an individual basis, and the total that each member obtains depends on the labor that he or she has contributed, and or any other criteria for distribution that has been democratically established by the members. The third benefit is collective because a cooperative's social funds are used by the group of people that makes up the cooperative. In some countries, general laws on cooperatives stipulate that cooperatives must maintain certain mandatory social funds, setting a certain percentage of net profits that must be contributed to each after taxes. For example, according to Venezuelan law, cooperatives must allocate 10% of their net profits after taxes to an emergency fund, another 10% to a social protection fund, and an additional 10% to an educational fund. In addition to legally mandated funds, cooperatives may establish other funds that they consider necessary, such as an investment fund. The cooperative can have these or any other funds that its members decide to create for their collective benefit to ensure that the cooperative will be able to deal with any contingencies and be prepared to face the future. In addition, the cooperative will be able to provide members with access to education, social assistance, food, housing, and other benefits that meet their common needs. The criteria for using these funds are also democratically decided by the cooperative's members. So, since I'm commenting after every section a little bit about how my experience, uh, or our experience in the co-op um, lined up with that. So uh, people definitely did contribute sometimes to the co-op as far as like equipment and things like that. Um, generally though, uh, we just paid for that, you know, like any business would just out of like ongoing surplus that we had. Um, and rather than having distinct funds, I mean, we budgeted annually. Um, most years we made money. I think there was a year or two we lost money. But um, we would pretty much just figure that out on a year-to-year -year basis. And because we were all doing similar work, um, we basically set it up so that if there was a surplus um, and we wanted to pay out like a bonus at the end of the year above what we were keeping in reserve for the company, uh, we would just divvy it up on the basis of percentage of hours worked. So if you worked 11% of the total hours between all the members, then you would get 11% of the surplus. 
et cetera. It was very egalitarian. It was very equal. We really uh, had um, really little to no hierarchy uh, as far as that went. And um, it was pretty good. I mean, I, I guess it's like, you know, the way that capitalists run firms. It's just that we weren't doing, you know, quote unquote, professional work or like, you know, not white collar work. Um, so, you know, it was um, we were definitely, I think, ideologically trying to professionalize what we were doing. Um, that was a constant struggle <laughs> with the world at large, though. And uh, definitely, I, I do think um, our co-op, I mean, the member team uh, definitely suffered under that strain somewhat. Um, just the, you know, indignities of doing customer service and the other types of work that we were doing. Um, it was really nice in our meetings to be able to come together and, you know, commiserate about poor treatment from uh, customers. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, knowing that we were the ones who decided everything rather than having a boss whipping us, I mean, it was helpful for sure. This is, of course, divorced from larger questions about socialism and capitalism. Uh, I will say that that was nice, though at the same time, there was also this feeling of being a little bit alone on an island as far as, you know, nobody really understood our position, even as a worker cooperative. We would try to explain to people what that even meant. I don't know if our customers were just dense or what, but it was like, they were like, you do what now? And it's like, never mind. I mean, we could say we were employee owned, but they would still think somebody was the boss. It's like, that was part of the thing for me that I was like, we really need something bigger than co-ops because until you start really reshaping the society as a whole, the idea is just not going to take. So there was really something larger than we were that was needed to um, clear a place for co-ops, in at least in our area. So, all right, moving forward, autonomy and independence. Cooperatives are autonomous, independent organizations in the sense that they can enter into agreements with other organizations, state, private, or other cooperative organizations, but under terms that maintain the members' democratic control. That is, members should retain the ability to make management-related decisions. Thus, a cooperative's autonomy is not just for its executives and representatives, but for all of its members collectively. Therefore, those responsible for a cooperative's management should be careful when interacting with other non-democratically managed organizations so that the operational logic of those organizations is not imposed on the cooperative. This aspect of cooperatives is one of the most controversial, above all when a government sets policies to promote the creation of cooperatives and or to ensure that they contribute to the social development of their communities or nation. The state and other actors obviously should provide cooperatives with support because those external entities can contribute significantly to the success of cooperatives, like with any other enterprise, as long as those entities are careful not to intervene in the cooperative member's decision-making process. Instead of direct intervention, the state can use mechanisms of indirect control, such as regulations and conditional clauses in its contracts with cooperatives. Cooperatives should enter into those contracts voluntarily, conscientiously accepting the social responsibilities they establish. On the other hand, state and other institutions interested in providing cooperatives with support while maintaining the ability to exercise some direct influence in the cooperative's decision making can encourage the creation of multi-stakeholder cooperatives where they are one of the participants on the board. Comment, I must say, this is not a concern in the United States where the U.S. government roughly acts as if cooperatives don't exist. Um, the only benefit I can think of that we were granted is that cooperatives get an extra six months to file their taxes. Well, and pay their taxes. Uh, so basically, instead of having to file on March 15th, you could file on September 15th. So... Literally, aside from that, I don't remember a single benefit to being a cooperative um, as far as the state is concerned in the United States. If anybody knows of any, let us know in the comments. Okay, continuing with that section, it is important to note that cooperatives that decide to be part of the higher tier cooperatives or integration bodies ought to cede part of their autonomy. For example, cooperatives that are part of the Mondragon Group must contribute a certain amount of money 
to obligatory and non-obligatory funds established by the group's governing council, comply with an established scale of advance payments, send reports on their management, and meet other requirements as a condition of membership. Therefore, the autonomy principle of cooperatives does not necessarily involve total autonomy from other economic actors, but those commitments are voluntary and are expected to promote the interests of the cooperatives. So just commenting there before the next section, I would have loved uh, that there wasn't anything in our area like that. Um, you know, I, I would have loved to have been part of a federation that, you know, you can see maybe building towards some kind of a parallel cooperative economy. Um, really, there just wasn't the interest in that <laughs> um, from the, you know, community as a whole. Like I said, the idea just didn't catch on. I don't know. I know that there are some uh, cooperative, well, I mentioned the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. There are also some like regional um, alliances of cooperatives and things. I am not sure if anyone listening um, has been a member of that or is privy to that. Is there a dues structure and do they actually materially support the other cooperatives? Because if this is ever going to be a thing, you absolutely need that. Um, otherwise, is it cooperation, you know, where or, or is it just, you know, you have in-house socialism, <laughs> like where everybody splits the profits. But then as far as the larger economy, you still have complete market anarchy with no integration there's no you need a system that's what i'm trying to say is uh until you start building cooperative federations i just don't see the point um aside from again or i don't see the point in terms of social transformation there is a point and you know like i said i did enjoy having input on the work that i was doing you know and i was voting with other people who were my peers and we all did similar work and we all cut each other you know we were very eager to compromise with each other to make this the best situation possible for all of us, wherever compromise was, you know, possible. Uh, scheduling, duties, whatever it was. We were very eager, eager to come up with the best situation for everyone, and we had a structure that allowed for that. But as far as social transformation, yeah, you need to, uh, you need to build something. And I'm not aware of things like that currently in the U.S., so moving on. Education, training, and information. It is crucial for a cooperative's members to be educated not only in job-related technical subjects, but also about the overall production process and the skills and attitudes necessary for effective democratic decision-making. This is essential to the participatory nature of cooperative's management model. To be able to make the most appropriate decisions about their cooperatives, members must first be prepared. First, they need to be informed about the cooperative situation and any options to be considered. Second, they should have the ability to analyze that information and reach a consensus about the best decisions. A cooperative can more effectively benefit from the potentials and advantages of democratic management if its members are well informed and trained, both to make use of democratic procedures and to make the most effective decisions. Therefore, it is important for cooperatives to have an education fund that allows them to raise the competence of their members to the optimal level. While this is crucial for the success of traditional businesses, it can be even more so for a cooperative or any democratically managed enterprise. On the other hand, cooperatives also need to inform and educate the institutions with which they interact. Given that a cooperative is an enterprise with characteristics different from those of a capitalist or traditional state enterprise, the institutions it deals with should know that they cannot negotiate it. <laughs> yeah, um, they can. You know why? Because they're stronger than you are and they don't give a flying fuck about what you want. But let me read on. The institutions it deals with should know that they cannot negotiate with the cooperative under the same conditions as other types of enterprises. I am just really stunned by that statement because yeah, maybe if you're Mondragon and you have like huge weight and you're the seventh largest company in the country, maybe they're not going to give a flying fuck about anyway. Ugh. As mentioned previously, a cooperative's representatives cannot make decisions in the name of the cooperative that have not been previously agreed upon 
or are not within a previously defined range of acceptable options. In addition, cooperatives are expected to contribute to the expansion and consolidation of the cooperative movement by informing and educating the public in general about the benefits of cooperativism. The more cooperatives there are, the more possibilities they will have for relating to each other according to their principles, strengthening the values of cooperativism. So like I said uh, before, there really is a huge amount of public education that needs to be done. I think people are not really socialized properly to be cooperators. Um, this is actually, it was at this time that I, I veered sharply toward Marxism Leninism because I was just like, you need to totally transform society for any of this to work at all. That was my take. So uh, maybe you can, you know, this is making more sense now if you've been listening to me for some time. All right, next section, cooperation among cooperatives. Historically, the most successful cooperatives are those that have been able to associate with other cooperatives, establishing relations of cooperation. Cooperatives can enjoy the advantages of economies of scale if they are horizontally integrated with other similar cooperatives to increase their joint productive capacity, obtain lower cost inputs, and procure sales contracts that are impossible for them to acquire on their own. Cooperatives also may engage in vertical integration with other cooperatives to ensure access to inputs and to the distribution of their products under favorable conditions, and so that earnings are shared more fairly among the members of the production chain. Moreover, cooperatives can come together to join forces and provide themselves support services, such as access to financing under favorable terms, guaranteed technical assistance, and even political or interest representation. Thus, cooperatives can associate in second-tier cooperatives on a territorial, within a given territory, or sectoral, within a given production sector, basis. Cooperation between cooperatives is also a tool for the stronger or luckier cooperatives to help weaker or disadvantaged ones, implementing the solidarity that should characterize these organizations. That way, their coordinated efforts allow them to be more effective, both in economic and ethical terms, and consequently in meeting the material and spiritual needs of their members. So commenting, I commented on this before, I did not really see much cooperation between cooperatives, um, and that's the end of that statement. It, it does need to happen for all the reasons that they described. Uh, I just in practice was not seeing it. and. Um, we, I think the United States has a negligible cooperative movement for as much as, you know, a lot of newer leftists want to get all excited about it. Um, the reality is a bit more sobering than, uh, you know, you're not going to be diving into a swimming pool full of rose petals. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of real, I can't even, I can't even finish that sentence. It's, it's terribly difficult. All right. Punishing. I mean, I, difficult doesn't even cut it. All right, next section. Interest or commitment to the community. According to the ICA, cooperatives should work for the sustainable development of their communities, guided by policies that are accepted by their members. However, this may be the principle that is least observed by cooperatives. Nevertheless, in some cases, the benefits of cooperatives' social funds have a scope that is larger than their memberships acquiring a truly social character by bringing benefits to their surrounding communities. For example, a cooperative may finance a child care center, a cafeteria, housing construction, or other services that collectively benefit cooperative members, and to which people in the community may also have access. Many cooperatives implement their commitment to social responsibility through their productive activities by providing quality goods and services that help to meet pressing local needs. Some strive to grow or to promote the creation of new cooperatives as a way of providing new sources of decent jobs. Cooperatives also should reduce to a minimum any negative effects on the environment caused by their production activities or by the consumption of their products. In our opinion, for cooperatives to effectively implement their social responsibility, they must establish mechanisms or spaces of coordination with the communities they intend to benefit. That would make it possible to ensure that their economic activities really do contribute to meeting social needs 
and to identify other actions that can support community development. Other principles. The previously mentioned cooperative principles are implemented by cooperatives in different ways according to their realities, the characteristics of their members, and their surrounding circumstances. Cooperatives implement these principles more or less rigorously, ignoring some or adding others. More recently, there is an effort within the international cooperative movement to add an eighth principle, which establishes a commitment to environmental sustainability. The cooperatives of the Mondragon Group observe the ICA's seven principles. Well, I thought we had actually just established that there are twice as many wage workers as there are members, but okay. And two more, retributive solidarity and social transformation. Mondragon promotes the idea that retribution for its cooperative's performance should not just be according to labor. Given that the value of labor is assessed according to the logic and laws of the market, that value does not necessarily reflect the cooperative's real work, capacities, creativity, and effort. Thus, cooperatives that earn the most have the obligation of sharing with those that earn less. However, those that earn less also have the obligation of improving their management and cooperatives that are repeatedly unprofitable are not accepted. Meanwhile, hold on, actually, <laughs> I think that should tell you right there why this is not going to be a replacement for the capitalist economy. It, it is the capitalist economy, just with some better coordination between industries and more democratic management, less exploitation in terms of where the profits go. But Anyway, continuing, meanwhile, the principle of social transformation reflects the socialist ideals of Mondragon's founder and leader, but its implementation has been quite limited for a number of reasons. Okay, we agree. An analysis of successful cooperatives suggests other principles that are important to take into account for a cooperative's success. For example, a cooperative can avoid wasting energy on conflicts among its members by having genuinely democratic management and forming values. But it is also important that its members know each other well before they create the cooperative. That way, it is easier to establish trust and communication. Comment there again. This is another huge hole in the whole, we don't need state socialism, let's just be co-op people. How are you going to do that? I mean, like, actually starting them up. Um, where are you going to get the money? I'm sure we will get into that in later installments of this series. But there are basically two ways to do a co-op. You can, just like any other business, start it from the ground up. Or you can buy an existing business and convert it to a co-op. Either way, you need people who are strongly committed ideologically to that pursuit. Can you find enough people for that? Because I'm telling you right now that most U.S. workers, while they may, you know, vaguely believe in cooperation or whatever, when push comes to shove, people are not prepared for what is actually involved in this process, in launching a business or whatever. Now, cooperatives tend to uh, fare better statistically than non-cooperative businesses, you know, small and medium size. I don't actually know of any large cooperatives in the United States, but we know that I think your odds are like twice as good or something like that of uh, starting your business and still having it be around a couple of years later versus like, you know, traditional businesses or capitalist businesses, whatever, have a very high rate of failure when they're starting out. Um, so the whole idea here is, you know, we're going for proletarian salvation People are suggesting co-ops as a route by which we can avoid a direct confrontation with the capitalist class. I don't believe that, um, but we have people advocating it. Um, so you have a bunch of proletarians who are defined by the fact that we have no capital. How are you going to start your co-op? Um, you know, even as far as bank loans for businesses, it's much more likely that you need an existing business, you know, funded by your Uncle Freddy or something. Uh, somebody who doesn't, you know, doesn't, is not a professional investor, uh, doesn't have the kinds of stringent requirements that a bank or credit union may have for investing 
in your brand new business that they have no idea if it's going to be profitable or not, if you're going to be defaulting on your loan or not. Um, or you can buy out a business. And let me tell you, co-op conversions, I've read a number of case studies, they can be successful, but they can also take many years and a lot of the workers don't want to buy in. A lot of the workers would rather have a job where they go in, they punch a clock, they do their work and they go home. They don't want to get more involved in that. That's a lot of people. What we found in our co-op was that, um, you know, what I thought going in was, hey, we will, uh, you know, pull random people who are interested and seem like they might be a fit for the company. Uh, you know, we'll put up our ad and, um, you know, hey, are you sick of working at the mall for a boss who doesn't respect you, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, who wouldn't want that deal? But we found that actually the people who worked out much better were the people who were already activists or otherwise had like a huge moral ideological commitment to the idea of co-op, social justice, socialism, etc. People who were just plain old apolitical workers, actually it didn't work out in most cases, sometimes spectacularly so with lots of drama. So getting from here to there, um, on this whole subject of, you know, knowing each other before you can create the cooperative trust communication it's a huge deal and you have a business to run the entire time so let's not underestimate the hurdles that we face just because we like the idea believe me i liked the idea a lot it's one of the reasons that i got into it it's incredibly difficult with many unforeseen problems that are just simply not addressed anywhere in the literature. I am here to fill in some of those gaps because everyone I've ever heard talking about co-ops exclusively talks about the positives. There just is no realistic discussion of the pitfalls and possibilities for pain. And they are numerous. I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying it's very easy to get a very rosy picture of you know what you'd be getting involved with or thinking about pursuing and you need to even if you're hell-bent on doing it no matter what cost and that's fine because you just really believe in pursuing this experiment that's fine but I want you to not get hooked just by the literature but talk to people for whom it didn't work out I would say my case was 50 50 we ran for a while, people got things out of it, we all got paid, nobody really lost money. Um, but it was grueling, you know? It was also very uplifting at times. But anyway, um, do not think your co-op is about to become Mondragon at a minimum. But really more than that, uh, there's so many nitty gritty details that just do not get treated in, in any kind of, they just don't get the attention that they really need to have. All right. That was a nice release for me because I've been holding on to that for a while. Let's continue. With respect to that, it is important for cooperativists to know that they have common unmet needs and that by cooperating, they can fulfill those needs in the most optimal way, not just economically or materially, but also spiritually and morally. That is, individuals who decide to be part of a cooperative should be aware of the need to unite not just to solve a temporary situation, but also as a way of life, one that places value on aspects that they cannot develop in other enterprise forms. From a pragmatic standpoint, members should make some sort of contribution to the cooperative's social capital, as mentioned previously. Commitment to the cooperative is expressed in the sacrifice that the member must make to cede part of his or her advance payment to be part of the cooperative's social capital. It is also a way of making it clear that the cooperative really belongs to all of its members because they all must make the same contribution. Finally, we should not lose sight of the Rockdale Cooperative's principles, which highlight the importance of the cooperative being economically sustainable. That is, to the extent possible, the cooperative should not operate with losses or with debt to recover. 
social commitment should not be understood as donations or sales below cost that end up compromising the cooperative's future. Cooperatives versus capitalist enterprises. Cooperatives should differ substantially from capitalist, that is, non-democratic enterprises. If an enterprise that is considered to be a cooperative actually implements cooperative principles, it will follow a management model that is substantially, not just superficially, different from that of an enterprise controlled by one person or a group of persons, stockholders, the owners of the enterprise's capital, who hire the labor power of one or more workers, that is, a capitalist enterprise. Table 1.1 contains a summary of the principal differences between a capitalist enterprise and a production cooperative. So table 1.1, I'm not going to put it on the screen, it's titled Basic Differences Between Capitalist and Cooperative Enterprises. And then it has a column for capitalist and a column for cooperative enterprise. And then there are different items. So the first is control over decision making. Capitalist enterprise, control over decision making is held by stockholders who are not necessarily workers. In a cooperative enterprise, control over decision making is held by the collective of members, all of whom are workers. Again, that is not necessarily the case in a consumer co-op. In a worker co-op, it is. Uh, just, I think that's significant if we're, they're really, really different things. <laughs> I, I can't stress that enough. Yet here, we're sort of using the worker co-op definition. So anyway, uh, next item. In a capitalist enterprise, the allocation of surplus is decided by stockholders. In a cooperative enterprise, allocation of surplus is decided by the members. So um, quick note there, the surplus. Um, a capitalist enterprise is actually not that likely to call it surplus, I think. Um, they're more likely to talk about profit so, um, I mean, they could if they wanted to, although you hear surplus very often in a cooperative. Um, surplus and profit. Profit, to get real simple, is basically income minus expenses. It's the money left over after you've satisfied all your needs, you know, out of the money that you made. Um, surplus has a similar meaning. However, you could talk about surplus in terms of the distributed surplus that was given back to the members or in the surplus that was kept for the business. Um, there, so there are some differences between those terms. Uh, I don't know, a little strange, I guess, that they use surplus for capitalists, but continuing. In a capitalist enterprise, workers income decided by stockholders and in a cooperative enterprise, workers income decided by the members, the workers themselves. So clearly we are using the um, worker cooperative definition here. Capitalist enterprise, workers' democratic rights. You may have a voice through unions, but you have no vote in production or management, really, except I think in some countries you may get a seat on the board. Cooperative enterprise, you have workers' democratic rights in each member having a voice and a vote. In a capitalist enterprise, the principal objective is to maximize stockholders' profits. In a cooperative enterprise, the principal objective is to meet the needs of the members. Though, to be fair, a lot of the time, the members need money, so. Capitalist enterprise, the owner's main motivation is individual benefits. In a cooperative, the owner's main motivation are collective benefits, material and spiritual. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess so. Um, you do have a certainly a different experience running a cooperative than you do as you know a, a, a wage slave, but you know in a capitalist enterprise, to the extent that you have like some kind of a firm with partners or a group of shareholders, um, those are collective benefits. It's just in a cooperative you distributed them over the workers and you have nobody else involved, ideally nobody else involved. Um, so anyway, are there differences? Yes. Are they extreme? I don't know. Continuing. It is important to note once again that the crucial difference between the capitalist enterprise and the cooperative is not the legal owner of the means of production or capital, but who controls its use and management. Comment again. I've objected to this earlier. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, 
What's an example of a worker cooperative where the workers don't own or hold the lease to the means of production? I just, that to me fundamentally defies the definition of a worker cooperative. In everything I've read, I don't understand this in the slightest. So, yeah, um, I just, I don't get it. I'd like to hear examples of that, I guess. I can't, I can't think of one myself. And also, if that's what we're talking about, why are we talking about that in terms of socialism? This is just crazy to me. Also, how would you get a situation like that? Really, I, I'm drawing a blank and I would like to know more about this. Maybe we will learn that in this book, but um, I have not come across that. So, and again, for the amount of reading I have done to not have come across that, and yet to have this be the new definition of cooperatives, I'm just like, huh? When is this book from? I think this book is from like 2015 or something. Checking that now. Sorry. This is, I know, unprofessional audiobook recording uh, territory we're getting into. It's from 2013. Okay. Uh, by the way, I don't really care about that. I am uh, teaching this material both to myself and to the audience, and that's the primary objective here. All right. So 2013. I don't know when the definition changed, but um, yeah, I'm really scratching my head on that. But all right, moving on with respect to that, it is important to note that the cooperative management model, again, just when when I think of cooperative, I think ownership. When I think collective, I think management. That was always kind of how I learned it. Collective refers to management. And a cooperative can have collective management or it cannot have collective management. You can, like they said before, have representational management um, rather than, you know, direct collective management. But yeah, I just don't get this. Okay, it is important to note that the cooperative management model, the organizational methods of democratic management that characterize or should characterize all cooperatives, is not something that a cooperative's members receive as a gift. It is a right that belongs to them by law. That law may be a country's general law or regulations on cooperatives and or the cooperative's internal regulations. Thus, from the relations of power that are established among members guided by cooperative principles, that is, from collective property materialized in collective management, organizational methods and everyday practices emerge that respond to the requirement that decisions should be made democratically by all members to the extent that they are willing to exercise their rights. Likewise, the fact that a cooperative's principal objective is to meet the needs of its members instead of maximizing profits, which is the case with capitalist enterprises, is something that is strengthened by its management model. That is, the members' emphasis on satisfying their own needs is not a mandate established by decree. Instead, it emerges naturally from their own democratic management of the enterprise. Here, it is important to note that because decisions are made by the collective, meeting individual needs means meeting the group's common needs, which in turn are democratically constructed out of individual needs. In other words, the collective needs that are prioritized are nothing more than the articulation of members' individual needs. Okay, well, that's kind of what I was saying before about like, okay, a capitalist business runs for shareholder profit, but then really a worker cooperative is just where the shareholders are the workers. So it's kind of the same thing. It's just not going to a separate parasitic layer. But I think a lot of this is a really convoluted explanation of that, my personal opinion. Okay. Therefore, to a great extent, the individual and collective well-being of members merges into a single whole. We live in a society, although there will always be individual interests that are not shared by the rest of the group. The individual slash collective well-being that a cooperative's workers propose as their objective is not reduced to access to material goods. It also takes into account the opportunities that all cooperative members should have for individual human development, both professional, the need to feel capable and exercise and expand their capacities, and spiritual, the need to feel useful and to offer solidarity. In this way, cooperative workers are not just driven by having higher income if their enterprise performs better. They are also motivated by knowing that they can decide how their cooperative's surplus, assuming that you have one, will be distributed and reused, and how to organize production in a way so that they will obtain optimal results 
by using each member's capacities, skills, ideas, and effort. Comment. That's the end of that section. I will say, you know, as bitter as I may sound, those are real things. Um, I think for me, getting involved in a cooperative, I just really wanted more out of it on the social transformation slash political level. And I think that while a lot of these things that they're saying are true, you know, you really can use your skills, ideas, and effort in ways that would never get heard in a capitalist business. That's a real thing. And it really can contribute to your sense of meaning and happiness. It really can. And, you know, the need to feel useful and to offer solidarity. The cooperative offers a structure where people really can bring more of themselves to work and feel comfortable with that and be rewarded for that. And everyone benefits from that benefits from that, um, not in this way that is getting siphoned off to capitalists. That is all real. But I think as far as, you know, these things being a vehicle for massive social transformation, it's putting the cart before the horse. I think these are the kinds of things we can have after political change, but not before. I just don't think it works like that. Next section, potentials of cooperatives. The cooperative management model is not a panacea. In order to work, it requires cooperativists or people who are willing to put the cooperative principles into practice. So this is what I was saying before. Really, like, try putting out an ad for cooperativists. See how many people qualify. Very few. And they've also got to be able to do the job you're advertising for. So it's like the odds of even finding appropriate workers for your cooperative is fucking minuscule. I mean, really, we had a consistent problem hiring people who both could do the work and who had this mindset. I'm telling you, this is, I think, the kind of society we can have after the revolution, but you need to change the fucking landscape first, honestly. Um, there's nothing wrong with trying cooperatives, you know, beforehand or whatever but i'm telling you the amount of people who are up to this it's like ridiculously vanishingly few okay they must fulfill their responsibilities and exercise their rights collectively for a common objective and not just for narrow individual interests in order for an enterprise to operate as a cooperative its workers should participate actively in decision making and democratic participation requires a set of skills and attitudes that have not been, this is exactly what I was saying, that have not been very well developed in our societies. Critical thinking, tolerance for different ideas, consensus building, etc. Bingo. However, these and other requirements for a cooperative's success, as well as its limitations for contributing to building a more humane socialist society, I don't think it will, on its own, not definitely not on its own, should not lead us to ignore the major potentials of cooperatives, especially when compared to traditional state and capitalist enterprises. Most cooperatives in the world are small and medium enterprises, SMEs, just of a particular type because of their distinct management model. Comment again, I know it sounds like a broken record here, I am really uncomfortable with moving away from ownership towards cooperatives are a management model. Please, if you're experienced in this, push back on me. I want to hear it. But I learned this up and down as ownership. So, continuing. However, there are consumer cooperatives, such as credit unions in the United States, and second and third tier cooperatives, such as Sico Sesola, Mondragon's Finance and Distribution Divisions, hope I pronounced that acronym correctly, that have workforces and sales on a par with major companies and corporations. But even the, quote, big cooperatives can enjoy the advantages of economies of scale while retaining the benefits of small enterprises. They are associations of small or medium enterprises that work in coordination while maintaining flexibility. Thus, cooperatives have all the potentials that SMEs have. First, they can be a major source of employment because they require a larger workforce to produce the same levels of goods or services. This might seem inefficient, but it is not necessarily the case. Without question, it is important to make optimal use of prime materials, especially non-renewable resources, which is why it is not efficient 
to produce certain goods and services on a small scale. However, for the production of many other types of goods and services, the supposed inefficiency of the SMEs is not really true when the narrow concept of efficiency is expanded to include considerations of social and economic effectiveness to produce to meet real needs. Moreover, the advantages of SMEs are evident when the appropriate value is given to the right to a decent job, which every human being should have. And if the goal is not to compete with capitalist levels of exploitation of labor and the environment. Comments. So that opens up a huge can of worms here that I think is almost irresponsible to uh, mention without including additional follow-up unless they're planning on it. But we're nearly at the end of the uh, article here. Blah, blah. If the goal is not to compete with capitalist levels of exploitation of labor and the environment, well, you know, there's a reason capitalists do what they do. It's to maintain maximal levels of profitability because if they don't, someone is going to put them out of business. I, again, this is the thing with co-ops where it's like, okay, you're going to be competing with capitalist businesses, though. Hopefully, we will address that in some of the later articles because I know it's a big question on a lot of socialists and communists minds people who are more politically oriented in terms of thinking the state should be doing things in socialism uh, of when i talk about you know moving mountains i'm talking about re-socializing people re-educating people etc but i'm also talking about leveling the playing field so that competition market anarchy and just bourgeois competition is taken out yes we can't run you know uh, businesses where you're just pouring resources down the drain, obviously. But um, if you don't have macro level governmental type forces reshaping the playing field, how do you expect to do this? Or you're going to be reshaped by the current bourgeois ruling class. They're going to use their power to reshape things to X you out. You know, and on that note, I mean, there's got to be some kind of a parallel between trade union, labor union density, socialist party representation in government, and the strength of cooperatives. Because it's fucking zero in the United States on all counts. And then in the countries where they do have a stronger cooperative movement, especially with state protections, you also have reforms that were introduced into the government by socialists. So just anyway, it, this continually bothers me, the um, divorcing from political goals. They have mentioned it a few times in here, but um, we're looking for comprehensive theories of social change here. At least I am personally speaking for myself, at least. Um, all right. Pulling back from that, finishing the article. Another previously mentioned advantage of cooperatives is their capacity to adapt to change, both in the type of inputs they use and the demands for their products, all without shedding members. Given that the essential strength of SMEs lies in the capacities of their workers rather than their technology, they have greater flexibility for modifying or adding new lines of production and offering new products that satisfy the many and diverse preferences of consumers. That is certainly true. Cooperatives, as expressed in one of their principles, also can contribute significantly to local development in their communities. Like any SME, they can pay whatever taxes are established so that local governments have the funds they require to meet community needs and implement local development projects. In addition, according to that same principle, cooperatives should not limit their social responsibility to meeting their tax obligations like any SME. They should also orient their production to meeting the most pressing needs of their communities without exploiting or promoting habits for consuming junk or lavish products. Because of the solidarity-based nature of their internal relations, cooperative members are expected to more easily internalize social interests. However, for that to happen, democratic planning procedures are required, including the diagnosis and prioritization of local needs as well as coordination between producers and consumers. Consequently, cooperatives have more advantages than other SMEs for local development. 
These potentials derive from the social relations of production, or the labor relationships that are established within them. The relation of associated work substitutes the relation of capital wage labor imposed by the capitalists on the workers they hire. To the extent that a cooperative implements its organizational principles in everyday practice, that's a key if right there, especially democratic management, its workers will participate actively in management-related decision-making. By doing so, these individuals not only will feel like the owners of their enterprise. I'm rolling my eyes so hard at that because they've just been stressing the whole time that that's not... All right. But they also effectively will be the owners in the sense of being able to control their cooperative democratically. No, 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 no. I just... Um, I feel like they keep flipping back and forth over a line. Am I misreading this? Let me know. Anyway, they also effectively will be the owners in the sense of being able to control their cooperative democratically along with the other members. Therefore, members develop a sense of belonging and commitment because they do or do not benefit from their own decisions and their implementation of and control over those decisions. They are therefore motivated to increase the productivity and quality of their work as well as their competence, and to contribute any idea or knowledge that might improve the cooperative's performance. In this way, unlike capitalist enterprises, cooperatives can fully enjoy the advantages of cooperation without being limited by the logic of private property or the subordinate relationship of labor to capital. The advantages of cooperation are even more beneficial for cooperatives when they horizontally and or vertically integrate with other cooperatives. Therefore, in many cases, cooperatives, if they have their own or external management expertise and favorable macroeconomic conditions are created, okay, we're just going to throw that one in there, like in the postscript here. And if, you know, there's an economy that's not coming apart at the seams, okay, may reach optimal levels of effectiveness because they are better prepared to use the advantages of decentralized and integrated or coordinated economic management. This may be seen in the global tendency to reduce the size of enterprises and give workers more participation in their management without renouncing the advantages of economies of scale through horizontal and vertical integration. Also, cooperatives may attain greater levels of effectiveness because their workers have control over management and are motivated to make the most of that because the extent to which they satisfy their needs depends on the success and sustainability of their cooperative. We should also note that another factor is no less important for analyzing the potentials of cooperatives in Cuba, as seen in the organizational principles of cooperatives, is that the cooperative management model appears to be the most appropriate for small and medium enterprises in a society committed to building socialism. Double underline that, in a society committed to building socialism, where the, which the U.S. is the absolute opposite of. They're committed to violently murdering socialism wherever it exists at any stage of its development, especially when cooperatives truly internalize social interests. The advantages of the cooperative management model become more evident in the process of seeking to promote relationships of association and cooperation between people and in opposing wage labor as unjust and inadequate for the socialist objective of full human development. That is the end of this chapter. Um, what did you think? I mean, if I was reading this, you know, in a print copy, every margin of every page would have tons of writing in it. A um, lot of thoughts on that. I mean, I obviously am pretty critical of a lot of it. Um, what does it come down to? These are not vehicles of social change, in my opinion. I think, you know, those key things they throw in there at the end about Oh, yeah, if you have favorable macroeconomic conditions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's kind of huge. Um, what do we have in the U.S.? Do we have that? No. And then do we have a country committed to building socialism? No. So um, I'm not trying to, like, shit talk Cuba as far as, you know, adopting cooperatives. That's not what I'm out to do here at all. It may be perfectly appropriate given their situation. Um but in the United States, I'm addressing the growing contingent on the left, which uh, I abandoned years ago, 
that was just saying, oh, yeah, let's just have cooperatives, blah, 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 you fucking tankies, blah, blah, blah. Well, how are you going to get from here to there? My answer is, you're not. And I'm not saying that to be an asshole. I'm saying that because I really think you're not for some clearly identifiable reasons. And I think most of the people saying this also have never been involved in a co-op. I have. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was a significant experience in my life. It was not the greatest. There was some real fucking misery involved in that. You know, there are ups and downs. Um, we need to transform society as a whole, not at the micro level. I sharply reject that, completely reject that. Um, yeah, do we need to have workplaces where people feel comfortable and are democratically involved? Absolutely. Is this the driving factor? No, I don't think so. In fact, what I see out of the cooperative movement in the United States is kind of a feeble attempt at, like, replacing capitalism. Like, like I said before, um, one of the big pushes at the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives is all the retiring boomers or like dying boomers, whatever, uh, whose families don't want to inherit the business. U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives um, promotes a co-op conversion as a way to keep the business running and the boomer, outgoing boomer capitalist makes money because the workers pay them. It's a compensatory, unlike socialist revolution, which is not compensatory towards the outgoing capitalists. Um, because why should it be? That business has been paid for a million times over in the case of a national economy. Get the fuck out. But, you know, in a cooperative buyout, you're paying off the capitalists to fuck off. And it's like you're spending more of your fucking labor time doing that. So a lot of problems, a lot of holes. Um, we're not, you know, so what, what does that amount to? It's like this feeble effort to almost sort of continue capitalism but like i mean it's almost like it's like you're continuing macro level capitalism because are the is fucking bank of america going to adopt this no and it's just there's so many questions that remain for me and um if i sound angry i am we don't have time to waste uh i you know i spent years of my life involved in a thing like this only to realize that it's not the solution we need in my opinion it's not the solution that we need. Um, yeah, you gotta work and make money. Would I rather work at a co-op than a regular business? Probably, um, but we need political change, the likes of which are not gonna come from microeconomics. We need the traditional, you know, the party, national utilities, all that stuff. It's just, um, this is, you know, like they said there, it's most appropriate for small and medium business. That's fine. What do you do with the rest? I mean, the people who are going to shut your lights off as, you know, part of uh, fascist, you know, pushback on revolutionary activity. Um, that's the stuff we need to get our hands on. We need to get the capitalists out. And this just doesn't really solve that is convincing like one worker at a time to like buy out, you know, convert their business into this and then take on all the risk financially of doing that. All right. I got 11 more of these to do, so I'm going to hold it here. Hopefully this has been um, an educational and informative introduction to the concept. And uh, I look forward to getting into the articles beyond just the introduction, which is all we've read so far. I'm sure there will be more yelling. Uh, this is a topic that does push my buttons personally. Um, so, you know, for good and for bad, for good and for bad, don't think I'm just slamming the idea of co-ops because I am not. But um, I think that the way some people are presenting them is just really off the wall, incorrect, and um, just damaging and harmful to people who are trying to figure out their politics in the wake of a collapsing capitalist system. With that, we're going to thank our patrons whose names are on the screen. If you want to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all you can sign up for as little as two dollars a month if that's not your thing liking sharing subscribing and commenting all of that helps to boost the videos in the youtube algorithm system and anywhere you can share it facebook twitter reddit discord etc is much appreciated 
for Revolution 2030. Thank you for listening, and we will catch you in the next video.